morning. This talk will be on Pepsilla, and yes, we have also just one minute. We have also Pepsilla in Belgium, in Europe, and yes, we also have problems on controlling Pepsilla. And this will uh, this talk will be on the control on how we go on uh, controlling Pepsilla in our region. But before to start with Pepsilla, maybe a short introduction uh, for the of the company which I work for, and a short introduction of pair growth in our region. So we have an idea on the growing systems we use and in which we did our tests. Okay, Fruit Consult, what is Fruit Consult? Fruit Consult is a group of 10 advisors of which three uh, give crop protection advice. I'm one of them. And we give advice for apple, pear, cherry, plum, and small fruit. Although small fruit is only in the Netherlands, which we give advice. Whereas for the others, uh, we also give advice in the other European countries, which are indicated in this slide. Our main activities are in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, and Italy. Now, uh, besides giving advice for fruit growers, we also are, uh, manage the, the experimental garden for fruit grow in the Netherlands. And I have a very short video that I can show you. It's in Dutch, so I'm going to explain you what you see. It's uh, an experimental garden is, is 20 hectares, of which eight hectares uh, uh, pear and seven hectares of uh, apple. For the rest, we have one and a half hectares of cherry and um, um, also some plums and a little bit of small fruits. Every year we have around 80 to 90 um, demos, which we demonstrate different things, mainly on how to grow a tree on different varieties and also a little bit on crop protection. On this side, you also have the big building, which does not belong to us, which is from the University of Wageningen. Uh, the research station, uh, which does also research on fruit growth and which also uh, works in the orchards we manage uh, on their research. So this is a quick overview of the research garden. Oh. Now, pear growing. Pear growing, uh, we have a lot of pears in Belgium because the climate is optimal for pears. And also we are an export country and we get more money for our pears than for apples. So we grow pears. And when you look at the, uh, the main uh, variety, this is conference pear. Conference pear, um, which has uh, exceptional uh, st uh, storability capacity and other, a few other nice uh, quality parameters. The other varieties, uh, main varieties are Comis, Lucas, and Durando. Um, these are the main varieties. And the surface is around 50,000 hectares of pears in Netherlands and Belgium. There used to be 10 years ago more apples than pears, but now it's more pears than apples. The average production is around 35 to 40 tons per hectare. And when you look at the, the tree systems we have, it's mainly uh, when you look at the old ones, it's mainly the old common system, spindle system. Um, this is the old system where you still have a, long, a lot of strong old basic branches. Uh, these are now uh, most of them, or at least a big part of them, are transformed in other types of trees, which we now more focus on younger woods in the tree, growing fruit on younger woods. Then we have the, the newer spindle system, the modern spindle system. We have the V system, the supple spindle, uh, the two liter system. Uh, and when you look at uh, the overall um, uh, pear growing systems, then you see that the spindle system is still the most popular one. Um, and for the production, the average ton production is 40, but with the V system, you can go to up to 70 to 80 tons per hectare and the modern system, uh, you have 50 to 60 per tons per hectare. So this is an overview on pear growing in our region, but I'm not really uh, going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about pear psilla. And yes, we do have problems with pear psilla. We have problems and uh, we try to give the best possible advice so they don't have problems with honeydew and they don't have problems with the black mold growing in the honeydew. But we, even with the best advice, sometimes it does not work and then you get remarks like this. The customer says, the products you recommend do not work. Your advice is wrong. Whereas we say, the products we recommend do work and our advice is good. And the talk of today is going to be on that. What did we do to convince that our strategy works or what uh, did we do to improve their strategy? Another thing where this talk is about, uh, this talk is also about European regulation. 
Why it's about EUP regulation? Well, in Europe, we have very strict regulation. Um, we have, everything has to be re-registered and we lose a lot of old products. And the new products, when they are available, they have a very uh, large label restriction, which makes it much more difficult to, uh, to find a solution. And uh, to give you an example, so every year when I give a talk to growers, I always have to start with a uh, sad uh, story. For instance, for this year, the story for the Belgian growers and the Dutch growers will be that is the end of, and I asked for the, uh, the name of the names of the products in the United States, the end of Enter, Enter, Interpits, and end of Calypso, last year's Envidor and Zeal, no future for uh, Avant. And the future of abamectin and amamectin are uncertain. They probably will not last. And it will only be possible to apply them in, uh, in greenhouse in the future. So this is the message I have to give to growers. And then you go to new products. We have new products now and then. It's already available for you. But for us, it's new. We have XDL. And then we are very glad that we have XDL because it does not only work against cuddling mod, but also has a nice side effect against beetles. But we can only apply it before, uh, only apply it during the season, not before flowering and after harvest. And we can only apply it if we have used 99 drift reduction technique. Oh, it has all, uh, otherwise, we cannot apply it. So you see, we have very strict regulation. And drift reduction nozzles, I will come back to this later. I don't know what the situation is with you, but um, a lot of growers are upset that they have to use drift reduction nozzles. But this. I will come back to this later. Anyhow, strict regulations, less product available. How do we then do a good psilla control? That's the, the main thing uh, what uh, we also ask ourselves and work, on which we worked on. But first I have a question for you. I'm going to start a poll. Uh, I'm going to start a poll. Ashley, is the poll working? Do the people see the poll? I see the poll. It looks like people are answering, so it's good. Yes. So which insect caused this damage? And I will enlarge the, 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 the pictures a little bit. Which insect caused this damage? So, um, and I have several options, beetles, sting bugs, birds, earwigs, caterpillars. OK. So uh, the two most popular answers are earwigs and caterpillars. OK. I'm not going to um, give the answer now, but I, I'm, I, I'm can, I can already say that it's damage. This damage, this type of damage, I really like. Uh, I really like this damage. I'm going to end the poll. Share results so everybody can see them. So you see that earwig is the number one answer, and second one is caterpillars. So um, I just said I really like this damage. It's, it's, uh, we see it more and more, and I really want uh, to see this damage, and I'm really glad, which is a bit strange for a crop protection advisor, because now, normally you try to avoid damage, and this time I want to see damage, but later for the, on this, later on. Now, uh, let's start with our story, and we are going to start in the year 2013. In 2013, we were confronted with the fact that the government said it will be the end of abamectin, of Agrimec, because it has a negative side effect on a very small mouse, a very exceptional mouse, and uh, so you cannot use it in the future. That was the message we got, so this would be a problem in the future. And because of this, um, I was not working at that point, time point for uh, uh, Fertonsult. My two colleagues started a project, uh, to see uh, if it's possible to control Perpsilla without abamectin, which looked a little bit strange because our strategy for controlling Perpsilla was mainly built on the use of abamectin. So how, how are you going to manage without abamectin? And we start a product and it, in Dutch, it was a duurzame aanpak van pereplatform. If I translate this, it means a durable, durable approach of Perpsilla. Now, um, we also made a short version of this name and we take the first letters and the first letters form the word dapper and dapper is the a Dutch word for brave. So the project was called brave and we asked the growers to be brave. What was the goal of the project? Well, we wanted to have no calendar treatments, but only targeted sprays. We wanted to reduce the dependency of the chemistry. We wanted to have getting, you know, get better insight in factors that influence the Perpsilla populations and this without giving in on quality and production. So in practice, what did we do? Well, there was a group of 20 growers in Belgium and Netherlands, 
of which we asked to split their orchards in two, to select one orchard of one and a half to two hectares and split it in two and treat one half with uh, a schedule, which is their own standard. So including Abamectin, the Agrimec, and the other one with the Brave strategy. Now, what is the Brave strategy? Um, so the Brave strategy is a selective schedule without the use of broad spectrum insecticides or insecticides with negative side effects on beneficial insects. In practice, this looks like th it looks like this. So they may not use ne neonicotinoids. They can may not use uh, pyrethroids. They, it's not allowed to use uh, uh, Proclaim, um, uh, Avant. Uh, you see what is not allowed. Preferentially, also do not use uh, Agrimec, Acel, or Insigar. What do they have to control their Pyrepsilla? Well, that's not there's not much left. Uh, you have uh, Belief, which has a side effect on Pyrepsilla. You have uh, Spirodiclofen, Envidor, and you have um, Ultor. And of course, uh, mineral oil and kaolin. So that was the only thing they could do. So the strategy consisted out of starting with uh, mineral oil or surround, but most of them used surround, kaolin clays. And then later on, they could also use uh, Mancozep, uh, which has a side effect on uh, reducing egg hatching. And for efforts, they used, uh, we recommended to use flunosamide, which uh, believe, uh, the product believe, which has a side effect on uh, the pepsil. Uh, during flowering uh, caterpillars, you, there was recommended to use um, uh, a bacillus thuringiensis to control it. So no negative side effects on, uh, on, uh, on beneficial insects. And then for the rest of the season, the only thing they could use was, uh, yeah, Ultor. Ultors, and then it should be enough, we hoped. So that was the schedule. And important to say is no standard treatments were allowed. So you always have to, uh, you were only allowed to spray if you, uh, if you observe something. So visual inspections were done every two to three weeks. And then at, at these uh, points, there was also an evaluation of the plague insects of the uh, psilla and also of the beneficial insects. Okay. Let's go to the observations and start with a few remarks. First of all, what we saw was that there was a really big difference between orchards and growers. Secondly, not everybody persisted in this, uh, in this ordeal. Uh, so we started with 20, but some uh, gave up. They were not brave enough to go on. Um, sec for, furthermore, we, saw, we didn't see any problem, problem, some problems with other insects. Um, then, also we mark it concerning spirit of the, the ultor. It was uh, new at that time, the first year that was it available. And there was some uh, less optimal use because we also had to learn to use it. And then last but not least, again, we were surprised by the multiplication behavior of uh, a Pepsilla. It really can explode. Okay, let's go to the results. And let's start with the beginning of the season. So most of them used two to four times surround before flowering. And you clearly saw then that th those that used surround that they had no problems with psilla during flowering. So this is uh, from 2014. And in yellow, you have the standard schedule. And in green, the dapper, the brave schedule. And then you see the number of larvae per 100 flower clusters. And then you clearly see that you have almost no uh, pepsilla there where the kaolin was used. So this was a good start. Everything looked fine. Everything was going good. So we had, uh, for instance, a one an example of such an orchard. So left side of the orchard was the brave part right side the standard part and then the main evaluation was on the fruit quality do we see contamination at harvest are pears contaminated at harvest and what was the result uh, we saw contamination but and when we compared the different schedules we saw no difference in fruit quality between brave or the standard so the standard schedule which included abamectin gave the same results as the brave schedule which was only based on um, on uh, the schedule i just shown Here's an overview. We had uh, growers, which uh, were in both parts of the orchard, there was a good control. We had growers where in which part there was a moderate control and, and, and where there was a bad control. But we saw always the same results in each part of the orchard. Now, this is good. Oh, sorry. This is good because you would, uh, this, uh, this uh, shows that you don't need um, these uh, broad spectrum insecticides. But there's something else which is really interesting, which we noticed. Now it's becoming interesting. We also looked at, uh, uh, at the presence of beneficial insects. And one of the things we looked at, or my colleagues, uh, we looked at were earwigs. And they counted earwigs. And what you see then, so they counted earwigs with these uh, polystyrene uh, cups where they placed carton boards. And then you see here that there you have um, 
earwigs. And they counted the earwigs in this, uh, in this um, cups. And then here you see the mean earwigs in these cups in the different orchards uh, in the brave part and the standard part. First of all, what is clear is that uh, where there was a good control, we always find earwigs. Where there was a moderate control, in most cases, we didn't find earwigs at all in these orchards. And was a bad control, uh, there was one exception, one outlier, but also there we didn't find earwigs. So there seems to be a relation between uh, the end results of uh, the control and both for brave as standard uh, and uh, the, the, the presence of earwigs. And this was not you, as you will see, because um, um, uh, my colleague also examined this in 2002. I will show you directly. Uh, and secondly, the second thing we observed was in the brave parts, in most of the orchards, not in all, we saw a, a little bit more air, uh, earwigs. Not a lot, but a little bit more earwigs. That's what we saw. And then we also evaluated the number of psilla after harvest. And then we looked at the number of psilla uh, on the uh, flower clusters. And here you see the number of psilla and then uh, expressed and together with the number of earwigs found in these orchards. And what we saw was that when there were earwigs, uh, you almost had no problems with, uh, with pear psilla after harvest. So this is also a clear indication that the earwigs are playing a very important role. And I have results of two years showing this, okay. Now, I just stated that it's not the first year that uh, my colleagues worked on this. Uh, my colleague did uh, uh, in 2002 also a survey on different um, beneficial insects. And there the title of his research was the missing link, finding the missing link of which insect played a big role. And also then he saw that um, there was a relation between the presence of, uh, of earwigs and um, the, the, the difficulty of controlling uh, pear psilla. Okay. So, AWIX play a, a very important role in durable system for controlling psilocybin. That is something we can cl conclude. But there's also a but. But problem is, 50% of the uh, growers at that time point, 50% of the orchards have no or barely no any AWIX. And it seems that if you spare the AWIX with your brave uh, standard schedule, you don't get a fast increase of the number of AWIX. And you can get a very fast decline if you use the, uh, the wrong products. And the best example is the use of indoxacarp. If you use indoxacarp, you, yeah, you really are, um, it's the best way to get rid of your uh, earwigs. Another thing, uh, until then, it was always assumed that predatory bugs were the main uh, beneficial insect for controlling pear psilla in a natural way in uh, the orchards in our region. But uh, after this research, and after, especially after the BRAVE project, it's clear that it's not that insect, but it's uh, the, 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 the earwig is much more important. The message we gave after that, after this project of two years, was to the growers, be brave. You don't have to use broad spectrum uh, uh, insecticide and stay brave. Because it seems that to get these earwigs, you have to uh, perform this schedule, this BRAVE schedule, or this BRAVE uh, strategy many years and then you get the earwigs. Oh, that's something we had hoped. So be brave and stay brave. And let's see if it resulted in, in an increase. If we, we every year we do a survey, and in the survey of uh, this year, uh, also two years ago, we asked them, do you see earwigs in your orchards? And remember, in 2013, it was 50% which had earwigs. Now it's 90% of our clients which are using the schedule of BRAVE which have earwigs. And we clearly see also this in our, uh, when we give advice for controlling uh, Perpsilla. It has become uh, easier. And I'm the first one to admit it because I worked for a pesticide distributor for nine years. And um, this strategy that we used, we had uh, uh, Indoxacarp as, um, uh, as a standard. We had a lot much more problems in controlling earwigs. It's much easier to give advice for food consult customers than it was for uh, in that time. Although it depends how you look at easy advice. When I was working for the pesticide distributor, I could always say, you can spray, which I cannot, now I cannot say this. I have to look, should we wait? It's possible we can wait, so it's, uh, that's how you look at it. Okay. 
do I have AWIX? How do I know I have AWIX? AWIX? Yeah, the, you can look for them at uh, in dark corners like a bird a bird's house here. There you can find them. I think all of you know it. Um, but the best way is, uh, for instance, uh, looking at uh, if you have, I don't know the word in English, but we call it talking sticks. These are these bamboo uh, which we place in the orchards for helping to form uh, our growing system. If you knock on them. And you place your hand out because they are hollow. hollow. Uh, if you knock on them, you will see that the uh, earwigs are falling out, and you can clearly see if you're earwigs. But the easiest way to check if you're earwigs is by looking at the damage. So the question I asked in the in the beginning was earwig damage. This is a damage caused by the earwig. And what's typical about earwig damage is that they always eat from the shoots, at the top of the shoot, and you have holes inside a leaf and holes at the border of the leaf. If you have both, then it's probably earwig. And so it can be that all the leaves are uh, attacked by these earwig. And we really like this because this gives you an idea. Also, when given advice, we can trust on the beneficials, they will take over. If you don't see it, I'm, uh, I probably will uh, recommend earlier to, to correct, do a correction, whereas uh, otherwise I can trust on this. Now, uh, if you look at the number of people which have earwig damage in, uh, in our customer, with our customers, we could, could say that we are um, around 60% of them have earwig damage. So they are in a really good situation. They have really help, uh, help from the beneficial insect to control um, their uh, Biopsilla. How you should you introduce earwigs? I think this is something probably you also know, it's a bit old fashioned. You can do it cheaper. Um, you can also have uh, bags with st straw inside and the, uh, it's really for not for introducing, but to give them uh, in young orchards the opportunity to find somewhere to shelter during the day because they are night active. Um, you could also use these cups, which we use for research, which are, uh, but in the end, to be, to, to be honest, um, not much growers are placing this in, in, in the orchards anymore, because um, especially uh, the older the orchard uh, gets, it, you don't need to place something. There's much, um, uh, there are enough places inside the orchards for the, the earwig to, to, uh, to find a place uh, for during the day to hide. So it's not done anymore and less in young orchards now and then, but most of them do, do not place it anymore. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but you can, uh, in such a cup, you can have, uh, when we did evaluation, you can have up to 96, uh, or we saw up to 96 uh, AWIX per cup. So it gives you an idea how, how large the number of AWIX that is, uh, that we can find in these cups. So you can uh, use these cups for transferring airwix from one orchard where you have a lot of airwix to an orchard where you don't have a lot of airwix. So you place them in a, uh, in a bucket and then you can transfer it. Uh, that's one way to do it, but to increase the success, you should also uh, uh, move their uh, housing facilities. And um, something, this is, um, this is an example of uh, something which is sold in Belgium and Netherlands. It's bamboo sticks, uh, Pretasect houses it's called. And it's, uh, you can bind it with a metal wire to your uh, poles in your orchards. And uh, they sell it, um, they try to sell it as a really uh, in every orchard place it because you need these uh, uh, resting places. But we do not recommend it to use it like this. We recommend it to use it as a way of transferring your AWIX from one orchard to another. So you place it in an orchard, you wait two weeks or three weeks, and then you take it out of the orchard during the day and place it in another orchard and then they will uh, be transferred. And the advantage is that um, the success, success rate of this type of introduction is higher than the other one, probably because um, they label that or no, they, they mark their houses with a sort of uh, aggregation pheromone. So they attract other um, airwigs to come together. And this also probably is as an advantage for, um, uh, for yeah, driving the success of uh, introduction of airwigs. Uh, for monitoring AWIX, um, an easy way to do this is just use two coffee filters, nail it to the, uh, pin it to the, to the trunk, and then you can have a quick evaluation uh, how is your AWIX uh, population. Um, um, that's also a way, but that's for, this for checking. Does this mean that our problem is now solved, that we do not have problems with AWIX anymore, that AWIX is the big solution? 
it's it's I already stated it's uh, we have less problems of control on the AWIC, but it's not that all the problems are solved. And I'm really glad that Louis Nottingham is really also working on uh, on AWICs, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Why is it that it takes such time before you have a buildup? Why is it sometimes sometimes you the AWICs disappear for some reason? We don't know don't know why. There are a lot of unanswered questions also about AWIC. So probably there are a lot of things still to learn to increase uh, to um, increase the, the efficacy of this AWIC introduction and to uh, have a, a stable system with AWIC. Anyhow, so AWIC are not a solution. This means I still have pre, uh, growers which see this and which say to me, the products you work recommend, even some claim, I do not believe in the brave strategy. I'm, I'm, I have some doubts and your advice is wrong. Whereas we say the products that work do work and our advice is good. And this brings me to the second part of the talk. And this brings me to the year 2018. In 2018, we had the introduction of a product, a new product, Siltac SF. It's a silicon polymer. It's if in fact just a strong uh, surfactant, but when you apply it in the orchard, you could uh, kill uh, perpsilla. And uh, yeah, it forms a, some kind of 3D structure. I, you have the explanation of the of the producer, anyhow it works. It suffocates the insect. The advantage is it's residue free, which is quite important in, uh, in our regions because the retailers have high demands for less residue on their fruits and it's com IPM compatible. So it looks like a very good product. And if you look at the trials, trials which were done by the research stations, it looked really fantastic. You could have an efficacy of 90% with this product. And then it was introduced in the market and then growers were starting to use it. And then it was, mm, the things which were promised in the research trials, we didn't see in practice. We saw orchards where it worked well and other orchards where it didn't seem to work. So we decided let's count how good it works. And uh, we asked some growers, leave a part untreated and let's count how good these products work, uh, how good this product worked. And what we saw was in some cases we had really high efficacy. 90% of the L1 and L2 larvae were dead, 82%. But we also had some cases of only 19% or 27% were killed. So we saw a very high variation in our efficacy with this product. So we wondered mm, what's what's going on here. Now it's it's a surfactant, and a surfactant uh, it only works when you hit the insect. So spray technique will be very important. So everything indicates that spray technique is going to be important. So we decided to go to look at spray technique. And this brings me to my second question. I have a question and I, I didn't know how to phrase it, but I have chosen for this way. I want to know uh, uh, your opinion on how hard you have to blow with your sprayer to get a good coverage of your trees. Take two things in mind, consideration, stand of your machine. So you have sometimes a one or two tree stands for high variation and also the rotation speed of your tractor. Anyhow, I divided it in four um, and I will start the poll. Um, stop sharing results. Um, polling one, polling two, launch. Okay, so uh, this is the poll. So how hard should I blow? Should I blow as hard as possible? Should I blow hard, but not too hard? Should I blow medium speed? Should I blow low speed? So um, can I, do you see the results? Okay. So most of them are now answering medium speed. Uh, second uh, one is hard to, but not too hard. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So this is what you uh, answered. So the harder to better, hard but not too hard, medium seats, low speeds. Okay, medium speed you say. Okay, let's see what we found out. So we decided to go and look at uh, spray technique. Now, um, when you look at spray technique, most researchers look at uh, spray deposition. We didn't do this because of two reasons. First of all, uh, we are mainly advisors. We are not, we do some research, but uh, looking at coverage, then you have to be a full-time researcher and spend enough time to do a, a thorough evaluation. So this was not an option. And secondly, and this was the main reason why we also didn't want to look at coverage, um, 
we wanted to see uh, this demonstrate also for the grower how important the spray technique is. And the best way to do, is, uh, do it is directly show what the effect is on the efficacy against pear epsilon. So we decided to go and look directly at the efficacy of pear epsilon. And what did we do? Well, um, I'm going to show you from this year only one test. Uh, and we asked the grower uh, when he had uh, 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 still had pear epsilon after harvest, we asked the grower to uh, do some variation in spraying. And the uh, 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 treat the parts with high ventilation speed, treat the part with low ventilation speed, and then these two blocks also uh, play a little bit with the driving speed. And then uh, as reference also uh, apply the double volume so we could see uh, what, what's the maximum that we could obtain, maximum fixity we could obtain with this SILTAC. So let's look us, let us look at the results. Uh, we used a classical nozzle, no drift reduction nozzle this time. So let us look at the results. This is the efficacy which was obtained uh, in this test. Efficacy which was obtained in this test. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, okay, check efficacy which was obtained in this test. And the first conclusion, uh, what do you see? First of all, on the left side, you see uh, driving at seven and a half kilometers with high and low ventilation. Then you have two, uh, two objects with uh, lower speed, high and low rate of ventilation, and then you have two times uh, the, a double volume. The first thing that we saw was that you do not need a thousand liter per hectare to get a good efficacy. Uh, 500 liters was enough. Now, to be honest, uh, most of the growers in, in Belgium and, and Netherlands are only using 250 liters, 200, 250 liters, 300 liters. That's the only what they use. But this grower used 500 liters. Okay, so um, you do not need a thousand liters. Second thing what we noticed is that when you look at the ventilation speed, uh, sorry, at driving speed, driving slower does not mean it, you have a better result. And then last but not least, if you look at ventilation speed, this can have a very big difference. If you look at the uh, uh, normal driving speed, which the grower used seven and a half kilometers, when he lowered his ventilation speed, then he had uh, much less efficacy. Now, this is the evaluation of L1 to L5 larvae. If you split up this evaluation and we look at separately the L1 to L3 and the L4 to L5, the main difference is in the larger larvae. When you had a good uh, spray technique, that means a thousand liters per hectare or uh, the, the seven and a half kilometers with high ventilation, then you could kill up to 70% uh, or 80% of your L4 to L5 larvae. But when your ventilation speed was uh, not optimal, you could completely lose your efficacy against uh, this older larvae. So the effect was very drastic. Um, yeah, I, I'm, and I didn't mention, but there are here yellow, uh, orange bars and blue bars. This was a V system, and I took uh, shoots from the outer side of the tree and in the side of the tree. So shoots that are really easy to, to touch with your sprayer and shoots which are more difficult to touch. But I didn't see any big difference here. Um, Okay, so we did a different test. I only showed you one today, um, but the conclusion was there is clearly an optimum, an optimum which we should know to have a good control of your pepsilla. Conclusion, spray technique is often not optimal and there is a big loss of efficacy, uh, in efficacy with some growers. That was the conclusion. And second conclusion, according to what we saw was that ventilation is the factor that seems to have the biggest impact on the results. This brings us to, um, 2019. 2019, we decided, uh, we wanted to know in 2019, what's the optimal ventilation speed for the different sprays? We, because we want, to, we are advisors, we want to give the, uh, the best advice for every machine, the optimal advice to every machine to have the best efficacy. So this is what, what our goal was. So uh, we evaluated, um, uh, yeah. Um, now we change, we all, uh, because uh, drift reduction nozzles are obligated in Belgium and Netherlands, we said we only are now going to look at drift, drift reduction nozzles and, uh, and not at the classical nozzles anymore. So everything which I'm going to show you for now are with drift reduction nozzles and not with the classical nozzles. Um, I said that growers are complaining, oh, maybe the poll should be uh, stop sharing results. Okay, um, the drift reduction nozzles, uh, are obligated. Uh, this does not mean that people are liking it. Uh, now it was first uh, it was first obligated in the Netherlands, and what you see is now in the Netherlands that 
almost every grower is using drift reduction nozzles. And in fact, most of them are not complaining anymore. They are, they are, the results are as good as, as before and no problems at all. Uh, in Belgium, we still have to, convince, have to convince some growers. This is uh, the results of a survey in 2019. Uh, I think we are now with our customer base because our customers are uh, using more of uh, drift reduction nozzles than the general um, uh, Belgian grower. I think we, if I have to have a, give an estimate, I think now we have 65 or 70 percent which are using drift reduction nozzles in Belgium. Anyhow, uh, how good are these nozzles? Uh, if, just my opinion, because it's not on drift reduction nozzles this talk. You have 20 percent more product on the tree, so this is positive. You have less less influence by uh, by wind, which is also very nice, and you have less variation in coverage within the tree, which is also very nice. So I'm um, I have to admit I'm uh, I really like drift reduction nozzles. Okay, but that's that's uh, my opinion. Now back to the topic of today, psilla control and finding the optimal ventilation speeds of the different machines. And here you have an overview of the different types of machines or let's say the major machines which are used in our country, uh, the major producer of, of, uh, of sprayers. And now I'm going to do something which you normally must not do when giving a talk. I'm going to show you a lot of graphs. If you do so, most of the time people fall asleep and I don't want you to fall asleep. So please do not try to look at every graph. I just include it. If you want to re-look uh, afterwards, uh, look again at the presentation, you can look at the graphs in detail, but focus on the red message, on the message in red. That's the thing I want to say. Okay, where's my cursor? I lost my, okay, that is it. So first test and also the, uh, the I, here I can explain how the graphs look. They are very simple. You have the number of larvae pursuits which are mentioned. Um, this one is a little bit wrong. It's not by shoots, it's uh, for 10 shoots. I don't, I, I have to check, check. Anyhow, the number of uh, larvae in the uncontreated and then uh, the number of larvae in uh, the different objects and the objects, the only thing which changes is the ventilation speed. On the left side in this graph, it's also always high ventilation speed and the right side low. And when you look at this, um, uh, as this uh, graph, you see no difference at all for this sprayer. That is when you look at the shoots. And I have to say, this test is with a sprayer with a grower which really likes to blow very hard. Everything is blown in uh, the high ventilation stand and uh, only one object is included in low ventilation stand. And that's because I asked him to do it. Now we looked at shoots, but shoots are already easy to touch with your sprayer. What about rosette leaves? Because that's where it's more difficult to control per cell. Well, on the rosette leaves, the, the picture was completely different. Only when, uh, when the ventilation speed was low, then you had uh, also the control of your larger larvae on, uh, on your rosette leaf. So this grower was blowing too hard. With this type of machine, you may not blow too hard. But this, I have to admit, I mentioned this is still blowing hard, eh? but not uh, exaggerating is the message. Then we go to uh, a machine which some finds the ultimate sprayer. And uh, also here we did a test and here we see the same thing. Huh? If you blow hard, you still have more peepsilla than blowing low. With the lowest stand, you had the, the, um, the lowest number of, uh, of peepsilla. So the best result with uh, this uh, ventilation speed. Blowing hard is negative for this uh, then we come to, to this type. It's a type hold spraying system. It's the old John Deere type. I, it's the same ty type as that. And here we see that the ventilation speed does not matter. It seems that it's under, uh, not relying on the ventilation speed, but one remark, be careful when you spray with wind because we did a test in 2018 when the when a grower sprayed it with wind, which I asked him to do. And then you see that it's more uh, influenced by wind uh, than other sprayers. Then if, so if there's wind, you have to blow harder to still maintain the good efficacy. But otherwise, no wind doesn't matter. And then we come with the three, three waves, three row uh, sprayers. We did uh, it with two types of three row sprayers, the Munkov and also the KWH. And here we see the opposite. In this case, it seems that, and these are the trees which are uh, in the middle and normally under the, the two, uh, uh, yeah, under the arm. So they are um, sprayed in, on two uh, sides at, at the same time. And here it seems that you have to blow harder. And also when you look at the other side, which is only reached by one side, also here the advice is blowing harder is positive. Now, how important are these little differences in efficacy? 
that's the question. And a very interesting question. How important is spraying technique for the end results of your control of pair epsilon? And I have to admit the most interesting part of the talk is coming now. We also did a survey in 2010 after doing this test, a survey where they, we asked uh, questions, how they spray, which machine they used, how do they do ventilation, how fast do they drive? We asked how they spray it in total. And we asked the questions, did you have to spray insecticides against Pepsilla after the treatments with spirotitramat, after you had uh, treatments with Ultor? Did you need, had, did you had the need for uh, uh, the doing a correction spray after this spray? And this is what I'm going to show you. First of all, remember for this sprayers, we said blowing hard is negative. Now you have, uh, uh, this, uh, so it's a crossflow sprayer. Um, so, um, so you have different types uh, with different uh, number of ventilators. You have the ones with one ventilator, two ventilators and four ventilators. And here you see the number of people, the percentage of people which had to do a correction after the, uh, how was the name of the treatment? After the ultra treatment. So after the ultra treatment, what we saw that was that all the ones which, which are spraying with the four ventilators had to do a correction spray. The ones with two ventilators, 60% had to do a correction spray. Whereas the ones with that, which had a machine with only one ventilator, there was only, uh, yeah, let's say 35% uh, which had to do a correction. So too much ventilation, blowing too hard seems to be negative. Now look, now let us look in detail for this one, the one ventilator. And if you look in detail, what we see is that we can get out of these service res uh, results, we can get uh, recommendations for how to spray. Because here you have the different um, uh, uh, ways of blowing. They are beneath, it's, it's mentioned, uh, I just covered it, how hard uh, they are blowing, it's beneath this. But anyhow, here they are blowing low and high. And we see that it seems for this prayer, there seems to be an optimum. When you have one ventilator, you can blow hard, but do not use the high stand, only the low stand. And then, uh, then you have a very good efficacy. If you blow too, not enough, there is much more chance because the greens are the ones that didn't have to react. Uh, 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 yellow are the ones that had to correct once time against uh, after Altor and uh, Ultor, and these are the ones that had to do multiple corrections. So it seems there is an optimum, and if you use this optimum, the chance that you have to do a correction is not that big. Then you had the tower blower. So this is a uh, double axial, axial spare, you could say, one above, one beneath. And here you see that it's uh, also the same image, uh, the same image that it seems to be that there is an optimum. If you blow too hard, the result will be very bad. If you blow too low, also the result will not be good. If you blow in the middle, the medium, uh, the medium speed, which was also the main answer in the survey, um, which I didn't share. Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, what we see here is that then you had uh, less chance that you had to do uh, a correction. And this is something we also saw in a test we did before in 2018 that there is an optimum with these types of sprays. With these types of sprays, you can have an optimum. We have an optimum. With these sprays, when we looked at it, when we did the test, we had a conclusion that there was no influence of uh, the ventilation speed. And in the survey, we find more or less the same thing. Only when you use stand two, which is not used uh, by most growers, most are you're just using the, the lower stand. And in the lower stand, it doesn't matter how hard you ventilate, how hard the, the, um, the, the motor of your tractor is running and how hard the ventilator turns. So it doesn't matter. Uh, the efficacy is always the same. So we see the same thing here than, uh, than below. And then we have the three rowers and there we said harder, blowing harder is better. And also at the survey, we see the same thing. If they blow hard, it's and so. Now I forgot to mention one thing, but one, one thing very important. When we did the test, it was with a contact product. So we saw that the efficacy uh, of a contact product is really hard, very hard depending on how you uh, do your spray technique. But what we see here, we asked them, did you, did you need to correct after spirotitramat treatments? But spirit is a systemic compound. It's a compound which normally, if the spray technique is less, uh, as long as you have optimal, uh, if you have enough product on your tree, it will work. But even with this product, you see that it is really important for spraying technique. So for spraying technique, even for these products, it can make the difference if you have to do a correction, yes or no. So it seems to be very important. So how important is spraying technique for the end results of your control spiller, pair spiller? 
It's very important. It can make the difference between the need for extra insecticides against Perpsilla or not. One remark, referring to the first part of uh, our talk, selective spraying to spare beneficial insect is more important than spray technique. So it's a, uh, that's the first message. And the second message is that a good spraying technique is the second step. Now, uh, just to give you an overview, because this is what we uh, saw, but in 2020, we also did a survey afterwards. And uh, in the survey, we then checked how many of our growers are now spraying according to what we see as an optimum. And then we see that uh, still for some uh, types of machinery, in green are the ones spraying according to how we now see, which is an optimal. And in reds, all the ones that are not really uh, spraying optimal way. So we see uh, in Belgium and Netherlands that a lot of people are using their sprayer in a wrong way. So um, we are now working on this. And uh, I'm very curious to see what the results will be in a survey by the end of uh, in two years time to see if they or next year uh, to see if they changed how the way are displayed and if is this has this have an did it have an influence on the end results do they have uh, a better and easier control of perhaps uh. then the question uh, i was wondering how well do the producers of spray equipment know their own equipment so i phoned five of them um, and i asked the question to them what is, according to you, what do you advise for your growers? Uh, which ventilation speed do you advise? Two of them, they answered, uh, they gave a very good answer. They said, that's the optimal ventilation speed. Be careful for that and that. They really know, and didn't know, they really know how to advise, give good for advice for the machine. The other three producers gave wrong advice or said, it's up to the grower. He may decide if he wants to blow hard and he can want, so it doesn't matter. So it seems that, Three on five in Belgium, for the uh, in Netherlands, the ones that are producing the machines, even don't know their machine very good, because uh, the uh, we now know what the optimal ventilation speed is, and they by themselves do not have any clue at all. So this is a bit, um, yeah, bit disappointing. But also good news, two of them really had a good idea, and these are, these were the ones we did test with the research station for looking at coverage. How was the coverage with their spraying machines? These are the ones investing in a good. Uh, uh, making a good spray. Um, uh, time for a question. Situation. Now we know the optimal ventilation speed. Consider that you spray with optimal ventilation speed, and after Movento, oh, so Movento, sorry, is the Spirit de Dramat, the Ultor. Yeah, uh, you have still large problems with Perpsilla, and now you are going to correct with an insecticide, and you want to get the most out of your spray you are going to do. So we have optimal ventilation speeds. I'm going to start the poll. Poll three, launch poll. And my question is now, what do you do? A, A, you drive slower. B, I use more water. C, I drive slower and use more water. D, I drive and spray every row double. Or E, I call my advisor for advice. I'm very curious for your results. A lot of people are calling their advisor. That's different from the answers I get in Belgium and the Netherlands. Okay, reading a little bit. At the moment, uh, the most popular answer is driving slower and use more water. Okay, uh, just one more second. I'm going to end my end the poll and share the results. So uh, the most popular answer is I will call my advisor for advice. That's good. Um, I, that's always what I say. If you have doubts, call me. Uh, and for the rest, drive slower as uh, is the most uh, the answer that was uh, the the ones which we like the most okay let's see we because we tested it into uh, at the end of uh, after harvest in 2020 we tested it for this type of grow this type of machinery and we asked the grower to do this for us it was in an orchard with extreme high pressure of uh, uh of pepsilla and we uh, his normal way of, of driving was eight kilometers per hour 500 liter of water per hectare used and um for the uh, uh and um, this is a ventilation speed um we asked them to spray double we asked him to drive slower or to use more water, and then he drive a little bit slower. 
And the clearly, the best thing you could do is drive double. You had no better results but with driving slower. You had no better results with driving slower or increasing your water volume, or at least the, the benefit was very small. So if you want to get the most out of your treatments because your problem is very high, uh, big, then the drive double is the message. We had uh, two years ago, a similar test uh, with another machine and we got similar results. But I have to admit, uh, this is something which we uh, wanted to do with every machine to see if it's uh, true for every machine. But until now, this is a bit what we see in, uh, so slower is not better. Now, uh, to be honest, we also checked uh, optimal ventilation speed. This is the ventilation speed, which is recommended by the, this producer for this spray, uh, sprayer. And again, uh, this was, uh, also, um, was also true. Now, what about 2021? What are we going to do in 2021? Well, we are going to uh, continue giving advice and we want to um, also learn a little bit more about uh, a few things about Pepsilla and also a little bit more about um, spray technique. And uh, what do we want to learn about spray technique? Well, when you look at uh, researchers doing research on, uh, cover, uh, on spray technique, they all look at uh, how well is your shoot covered and they focus on that. Whereas as an advisor, I'm really interested not in this part of the tree, I'm interested in these parts. Pepsilla, after flowering, is in the top of the shoot. Uh, scap on apple, in fact, in the top of the shoot. Where are the, where is the most difficult part to treat your, um, uh, to get a good result of your Pepsilla? It's on the cluster leaves. So I'm interested in that. And for the, the fruits itself, I'm quite interested to see not the coverage at the side, which is easy to reach, but the coverage on the other side. Because if you are spraying against um, storage diseases, what about, is there some way how we can, can improve the other side, the coverage on the other side of the, the trees? So this is one of the things, if we are going forward, this is some things which we would look at. And we are going to look at, um, don't know yet how we are going to do it. We have some ideas, but. Uh, and the second thing which we are going to do, and this is, uh, uh, I'm really nice that we can uh, do this. Um, the, the whole sprayer, whole spraying system developed a sprayer, which has uh, these sensors behind. And these sensors, uh, they measure uh, if there's a, a tree present, yes or no, if the branch present, yes or no. And then you, uh, the, the, you have three zones in which the nozzles are operated on an on and off uh, base. And then you can have, uh, uh, spraying based upon detection if there's a green a front of your nozzle, yes or no. Um, and uh, it's very interesting for us because in this technique, you can reduce, reduce your drift reduction, which we want because we have a very high requirements for drift reduction. And for the grower also interesting because they can have savings up to 20 to 25%. Now it's not really completely new because there, uh, in a while ago, there was also the same development, but for some reason it did not, uh, it stopped and um, it's not uh, available anymore, but it's now available uh, again. And it has been tested by the research department of uh, Wageningen. So they looked at coverage and when they look at coverage, everything looks fine. So they looked in detail at coverage and it should work fine. So what are we going to do? Well, we are devices. We want to put these machines to the ultimate test. But first the video. So this is a sprayer, normal driving speeds and now it's in slow motion. It was during the development of the of this uh, technique that they they took th this video, so it only sprays when you have uh, some green material in front of it, and the research lo uh, researchers looked at uh, the coverage of uh, after doing this in this way, and it looks fine. So you only see the, the operating of the, uh, the nozzle for the upper part of the tree. You don't see the operation of the, the lower nozzles. For, uh, so, okay. I'm not going to show you the whole video because it's, it goes on. So what we want to do is um, look at how good it really is. Because uh, if you want to really trust on it, then you have to evaluate how good it is on SCAP. Because, uh, so this is what we are going to do. We have uh, two growers, probably three growers, which already have the machine. There are four growers, but we are, three are going to join. And also we have a machine at the experimental garden and we are going to control uh, SCAP with the sensors and without the sensor to see uh, if it's as good as they promise. 
and do some detailed testing on Pepsilla, on coverage, on, on the efficacy of Pepsilla. I'm really looking forward to doing this. Um, and uh, all my colleagues are also looking at the other part because there's a sensor uh, on it. And with this sensor, you can also couple it to GPS so we can get data on the sensor, which you can use. Um, maybe it's not the best sensor, which will give you a very detailed view. But the question is, do you need a really detailed view? Maybe it's enough what you get out of this sensor. So this is another topic which is looked by, by my colleagues, not by me. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. And I have two messages for you. Be brave and stay brave. Be brave. So um, you don't need this, um, this um, uh, more broad uh, spectrum insecticides to control your Pepsilla. And uh, keep on doing that. And then the end, you will see earwigs coming. And then you will see that your Pepsilla control will be get easier. And you have less problems with Pepsilla. And the other one is question your spray technique and optimize your spray technique. But then, because then you can really also gain a lot of, uh, of uh, efficacy for your Pepsilla. And this brings me to my last slides and I'm going to end my presentation uh, so you can see me and then it's time for questions. Thank you so much for your presentation today. We have a few questions that have already come in. The first question is, do earwigs act as an indicator species for other natural enemies? If there are earwigs, is it more likely that other beneficial predators or parasitoids will be present? Yes, because earwigs only have um, one generation per year. So uh, if you uh, hurt them, you will see it very quickly, whereas others have uh, more generations. So it, it is an indicator species, that's true. Yeah, so probably you will have also other uh, beneficial insects which are then also more present than, uh, than uh, so this also probably will play a role. Yeah. In the Pacific Northwest, we are also concerned about pear decline, which is spread by Paracilla. And if you're not familiar with pear decline, it's a phytoplasma-based disease. I okay, I so do you have that in Europe? We have pyrocline. Uh, the problem is bigger in the south of Europe than in our region. And in our region, it's, uh, we can solve pyrocline uh, when we see it by, um, we apply a special mixture of, um, of uh, fertilizers uh, to these trees, which we have it. And then we see that they can grow out of it. So pyrocline is, um, if you, um, you have to watch out if you have it and then treat, uh, perform this treatment and then you can, um, but the more extreme uh, you, your weather is, the more difficult it will get. So it's uh, in our region, it's, it's solvable, but the more you get souder, then it's, it's getting more difficult. So, um, so uh, th this person is wondering if um, they're curious as to whether or not this promotion of biological control could be effective enough to prevent the spread of the disease between home orchards so that those people that may have a few fruit trees. Um, um, we have a better control of Pepsilla. We have lower numbers of Pepsilla. So um, if Pepsilla is a spreader, normally you should have less risk. Um, that's clear. Um, I, for instance, if you lo just look at uh, the number of Pepsilla after harvest, where there were earwigs, there was no Pepsilla after harvest. So even then the pressure and uh, uh, you, know, you all know that you have uh, a lot of in wintertime, the Pepsilla will migrate to the neighboring hood uh, and, and go to these orchards or these trees which are infected. So in, normally it should be better to have earwigs because you then you have a low pressure at the end of the season, lower uh, risk for, for migration and so on. So that's my opinion. But again, I, I, I repeat that we are not really afraid of, 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 um, of phytoplasma in, um, in pear. Phytoplasma and apple are more difficult, but in pear, it's, uh, you have to be watched out and then uh, take care of your tree and uh, good, make sure that your soil is healthy and then uh, fill in also a little bit of extra, this mixture we recommend, which is of um, uh, nitrogen, um, magnesium, iron, and humic acids, I think. Um, Are there multiple Paracilla species in your region and how does Northern Europe maritime climate affect their overwintering and egg laying capacity? Paracilla seems to be a bigger problem in the US at 
more northern latitudes that tend to be colder? Um, I think the Pepsilla problem is uh, as big in southern Europe. I think even they spray even more. Um, uh, no, I, I can clearly say this, the problem is is as big as uh, in both regions, so we do not see it. Concerning the species, it's it's um, it's one of the things we want to look at and have a good survey of the different species which are uh, present. Uh, this is a question we have uh, we ask ourselves also, uh, which we want to have a, a clear idea on. Now we don't have a clear idea on uh, the the importance of the different species. This is also an open question for. Us. But it's clear for uh, when I, uh, I think your uh, dynamics or the population, uh, the, diff the importance of different uh, species is probably a little bit different from ours, I mentioned. Then frost, because there were a lot of questions in one question. Um, we are always very glad that there is frost uh, because then some uh, insects are dying. And um, one thing I wanted to test, this is American research. I was, uh, I'm quite uh, interesting, uh, interested to see because there was some in, in, uh, research where they applied surfactants during winter time on, on Pepsilla and then the adults uh, died much more quickly. And I was planning to do this, this winter time. And first there was no frost or the frost was not deep enough. And then we had very high frost or during the day. So I didn't have any chance to do it because the conditions were not fine. But anyhow, frost is killing the insects and uh, I think the besides uh, Caroline we are because we are also looking at um, the strategy of um, Louis Nottingham applying star Caroline uh, to our orchards um, for us it was new so we are now testing it also and besides that we are also uh, will we are also looking at the application of uh, these surfactants so to reduce your pepsilla in the, in winter time or early very early season Do you feel as though these spray techniques would apply to the large 3D canopies that are typical in the Hood River region? So here we have big old standard style trees. Yep. Um, I'm going to compare it. It's not really comparable, but uh, the cherry trees are also are a little bit big, bigger. Um, and uh, the only thing what we see is you have to be more careful for the upper part of your tree to get a good coverage. Uh, so it's more difficult to have a good coverage on the upper part of, of your tree. So this will be the will be the most difficult one uh, to uh, to solve. Um, this is also something which we see with cherries. So and then it's for Drosophila Suzuki. Uh, it's much more di more difficult than to have a good control in your upper part with uh, with yeah, less optimal spraying. Yeah, yeah. So the top of the tree will be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. What speed is high, medium, and low for a sprayer? Uh, uh, the speeds for the high speed, uh, so the ventilation speeds or the driving speed. Ventilation speeds? They did not ask, or they did not specify that. Uh, yeah, I, 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 what I can do is um, maybe, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it depends, and I don't know how to mention it. Uh, so the, the, it's the, the, the the axle uh, speeds, uh, which is used, uh, which determines the ventilation speed. And um, to be honest, uh, it's very difficult because it depends on which type of sprayer you use. And, and uh, what we did last year, but we did not finish, uh, what we should do is measure the wind speed coming out of the ventilation speed. And then we can uh, really state and you can compare it with your sprayers. So uh, to answer what is high, low, and, and, and medium, depend, it will depend on the sprayer. Um, So if, if this person wants to uh, wants to have more details, let them send them an email and I will send you the details of um, of this, uh, what's, what's high and medium and low for the things I tested. Thank you so much. That would be, that'd be great. So please reach out to us if you ask that question and we will try and get you more information. Did you mix the Spyro Tetramad and the Siltac? Um, Siltac, did I, I did not mention, but Siltac has, um, um, it has a manual to be used. So you can only use it after uh, you have applied Movento because early in the season, it, uh, uh, it causes phytotox. So this is, uh, it's, it's, you have to be careful. And uh, that, that's one of the rules. You have to spray it during the day when it's not raining uh, at the most sunny part of the day, uh, the hottest day part of the day. So it's, it's, and you can also not spray it just before harvest because then you have a little bit, uh, then you're 
pairs, or at least the conference pairs turn a little bit uh, on, uh, red. So there's a manual for this. So combine, combining for uh, not, but uh, to give you more information, uh, we advise to add an adjuvant with uh, the spirit tetramat because uh, this clearly uh, enhances the uptake in the of spirit tetramat and enhances the efficacy in the more difficult parts of the tree. So I would advise to uh, uh, add an adjuvant, but it depends also on which formulation you have. If you have the formulation, the OD formulation, then you we don't, don't, do not recommend it. But if you have the other formulation, the SC, I think, uh, then we recommend to add an adjuvant. So someone um, said, I want to know a little more about what monitoring technique they use to get to know the number of insects in the crop and how often do you monitor? Um, depending on which insect you knocking, yeah, the, the standard technique for evaluating a uh, rectangular uh, cloth or, or a box and then knocking. Um, when looking, when I do evaluation, you also look at the number of uh, shoots where you find the, the pear psilla. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the insect. Um, and uh, it's, it, of course, I often ask, ask this, but you, it's always the finding a balance and uh, how much pair, uh, so uh, earwig damage do you see before, uh, and this you take in consideration with how many pair uh, psilla you find or how many shoots are, uh, have pair psilla. So it's more or less a, a balance what you what you get. And it will also depend on how many shoots you have. So it's it's not a clear answer that I get, but the monitoring techniques are knocking and watching with a magnifying glass in tip of your shoot. And um, um, and we models also eh, for some insects. Uh, for a lot of eh, a few insects, which we use models, but not for Pepsilla. We have a model, uh, which is promoted by the Belgian Research Station for food coat, but we uh, already used a, a Swiss model in the past, and um, it uh, it works in the beginning of the season. You can use it, but in practice, we didn't find it very useful for the growers itself. So it's still visual observations, which are more important than the model for Pepsilla. Do you have a threshold for deciding to apply insecticides for Paracilla? Again, this depends if you see um, airway damage or not. Um, and um, and which the type of systems you have. So it's it's not really a number. It's um, and sometimes you also take in consideration the 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 history of the orchards. So um, difficult to express in a number. But try to wait as long as possible. And what, what often is done is, is look at how many honeydew there is. If you see that the honeydew doesn't form any problem, uh, as long as it doesn't form any problem, you can still wait, especially as if you have earwigs. And if the honeydew uh, is becoming, uh, comes close to the, um, to the pears, then, it's, it, then you, are, uh, you, are, you are quicker for advising something. And it also then depends if you have uh, overhead uh, irrigation. If you have overhead irrigation, which is the case in the Netherlands, and it's more exceptional in Belgium, Netherlands, uh, a lot of water in the Netherlands. You see every water always when you drive to the Netherlands. So they have overhead irrigation, so they can uh, uh, perform rain treatments uh, above their uh, canopy, uh, which is also which was uh, in a talk by Louis Nottingham. So this is performed for controlling Pepsilla. And in this case, if you have overhead irrigation, you can you can uh, you can uh, go very far before uh, uh, advising a spray. So it really depends on what type of orchards, how it is. Also, for instance, if an orchard is very uh, has a lot of branches and you you cannot reach with your sprayer in the middle of the tree, then I would always always also advise to spray quicker because I know that it will be difficult if I do not uh, do a correction now. The grow it will be more growth later on, and then you still have have. Uh, this, uh, then, then you cannot do any correction because you cannot reach it inside the tree. And then the main advice is that he has to change the, uh, uh, his way of pruning or his, uh, the fertilization uh, has to be less. So it's a lot of factors you take into account when um, deciding to uh, apply an application. Could you go into more detail on Mancozeb for control of Paracilla timing application rates? And um, I'd like to also direct you to the, if you're asking this question or wondering about using Mancozeb, I'd like to direct you to the uh, pesticide guide for the Mid-Columbia and the Rogue River region for more information on that. But uh, if you have any information, Stu, we'd love yours as well. 
we uh, for us it's the last year that we can use it we are going to lose it because there is um, mycozap has had some bad news some uh, it was linked to cancer so uh, we are going to lose uh, mycozap in europe which is especially for potatoes um, difficult um, so when you apply it it's uh, mainly um, uh, yellow x white or yellow x um, that I would focus on the yellow X. It's difficult, yeah, a yellow X. Now I'm going to be honest, uh, and this I uh, differ from my opinion from my colleagues. My colleagues believe that it has some effect. It's 40 percent, but uh, I'm often uh, dissatisfied of the effect. So I have to admit I'm not one advising it a lot, um, but my colleagues are. So sometimes we even differ a little, differ a little bit in advice. Um, uh, yeah. What other natural enemies do you observe in pear orchards? Um, uh, what are the, um, now I have to admit, um, I'm going to open Google for have a translation on these insects. Um, yeah, um, uh, so we have the predatory bugs. Yeah, wigs, uh, spiders. But the spiders, uh, there was a nice uh, research product in Belgium. The spiders you can find a lot at the borders of your Orchard, but not in the orchard. Uh, you have um, uh, green lacewing, uh, which is uh, present. Um, um, green lacewing. Um, yeah, predatory mites for the uh, for the mite control. Um, then we have the fluvial net. Uh, Trombidium holocericeum. You know this one, the letter name. Um, let's see if I can find the English name of this insect. English one. Uh, I would suggest uh, I will send you an email with uh, the, 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 the English name. And, uh, I will send you an email, Ashley, and then you can send them to the ones that are asking the question. Then they don't have to wait for my translation for the insects of uh, Dutch. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for trying. Yeah. Uh, we really do appreciate it. So somebody writes, I understand earwigs nest below ground. What are your weed strip control methods? Um, so uh, conventional growers are use herbicides, but uh, often you get the question, uh, what about biological growers? Biological growers are, are doing mechanical weeding and um, they are disturbing the, the, the habitat of airwigs, but it doesn't seem to have an inf influence on the, on the, on the number of airwigs. So, um, but if you want to enhance um, your, uh, um, your airwigs, uh, on the floor of your orchards, you leave your pruning material there. So that is what we uh, say. And also, when you mow, you mow your uh, uh, grass uh, towards the the green uh, to, towards the black strip. So you have more organic material there, and this uh, will increase your um, your habitat potential for earwigs. So that's what we recommend. But it's not done by all growers here. So it's it's um, I have to admit. Um, Pruning material, that's the, that's the one that uh, we, the really brave growers are doing this. They are going all the way, but uh, not, not uh, yeah. I don't hear you, Ashley. Is the timing of the Altor sprays important to help its systemic to work well? The Altor Movento. says, Movento. The Movento, yeah. Um, what I say to growers is when you apply Movento, uh, uh, talk to your uh, farmer, which has sugar beets or something else, other crops. Movento is like a, a, a herbicide. And talk to this farmer and ask him when he sprays to have the best uptake, to get the best results. And they know, because if you look, I, I used to give also advice for, uh, for sugar beets and so on. They know exactly when to spray to get a good effect. So they will spray early in the morning. That's the best way, way or even the evening. So that's what I advise. So spray at these time points to get the best uptake possible. And if you have uh, uh, days with high temperature, uh, then split your applications uh, during different days in the morning. I would rather have you to, uh, to uh, split it over three different mornings than spray uh, all the whole uh, until noon, uh, all your orchards. So I uh, prefer then that you, that you split your applications over different mornings to get the best uptake. So everything is towards the best uptake possible. 
And for the rest, um, yeah, I hope this is uh, an answer to your question, yeah. Do you recommend spraying oil with Altor Movento? Uh, no, so you have the oil formulation, which already contains oil, which is available not in Belgium, but in the Netherlands. And then the other formulation, it's uh, just a surfactant, no oil. Um, it also we also have to be careful. Um, some, especially with apples, some variety are susceptible to uh, to, uh, to Movento. You, so you can have phytotox. So um, giving advice on this, then I would say uh, contact your local advisor to see what's possible. I think uh, it's there. You can do it sometimes with oils, but then you have to watch out for which variety you are working with and so on. So I'm not going to. But we recommend uh, surfactants and not oil. Do you do much nighttime spraying in Europe? Um, uh, when the, um, when uh, Apamectin, Agrimec was introduced in the beginning, it worked very fine. And then it seems that it uh, did not have all the way the effect. And then you saw a tendency because it's broken down by, uh, by UV. And then you saw a tendency to spray later and later and night spring. Um, but um, this, is, uh, this is not done anymore. So. What will happen is when you have, for instance, uh, 27 degrees uh, for four or five days, then growers will start uh, spraying very, very early or uh, even start something, for, for instance, the Movento spray already, uh, the Spirit of spray already on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a wet leaf uh, to get the most out of it. So they, then they will go as, uh, already in nighttime also uh, to, because there are no possibility, but it's linked to uptake and not to sun. And then, uh, just a link um, to, to um, uh, not nighttime spraying. Again, if you look at Drosophila, Suzuki sprays, then it's preferential that you spray in the evening, for instance, with uh, spinosad, uh, because then you have uh, less breakdown, a better effect of your spinosad, which was clearly hit, or nicely shown by uh, research. And also the same result, I think, with Exidel against uh, Drosophila, Suzuki. A be you, it's better to spray in the evening than it is in the morning. And then some spray, spray go, will grow, spray very late, but nighttime, some are still doing, but it's not something we uh, really recommend. If it's not on the ticket, on the label, because we have some products in the Dutch Netherlands where you can only spray when the sun goes down. So have you done any spraying after harvest, probably to control the winter form of Scylla? So um, what we recommend after harvest is the use of this Siltac product. Uh, to reduce. That's the one which we have the better effects. And the other insect we do not recommend anymore because uh, for uptake of uh, the insecticides that need uptake, the leaf is very hard. So uptake will be uh, not good. Uh, the temperatures are uh, often not optimal for most uh, insecticides. So there's always a negative uh, effect, uh, not ne ne something negative uh, playing around with these insecticides. But with, uh, with the surfactant, they st uh, still work fine. Uh, and you saw that you can really have a nice effect uh, up to 90% of your uh, large larvae, then you really can, uh, uh, if your spray technique is good. So that's what we can recommend if one wants to have a correction after harvest. So how are you addressing thrips and other true bugs without disrupting the beneficial insects? Um, I have to admit, thrips is not really a problem for uh, the, the pears we are growing. Uh, so thrips, it's not really a problem, but we have uh, other bugs. And then uh, what we do for bugs is, um, for instance, um, if you have uh, uh, apple uh, pear blossom weevil, uh, which is then we spray after harvest. And sometimes in Belgium, we use a peritroid uh, because this is, works the best. So we hurt beneficial insects. Uh, but um, yeah, so we spray uh, very early in the season, late in the season with this uh, um, insecticide. And sometimes also you have a uh, sawfly and then you have to spray with acetamaprit, for instance. Um, then, so sometimes you have, don't have a choice, but then you uh, take the option, which is the, uh, the most favorable for the beneficial insect. So you kill the least beneficial insect possible and you have, uh, you have a margin, you still can use. And also for instance, for Ar Agrimec uh, or Abamectin, what we say is you can use Ar 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 Abamectin one, one time, no problem, but never two times because then you are killing your, uh, your earwigs. But one time uh, then, then uh, the population stays big enough. So we allow, there is some room and margin uh, to control other insects with uh, a little bit more broad spectrum insecticides, but you have to make your choice carefully. 
So we have uh, just some like general horticulture questions about Europe. Um, do you have any pear varieties that are cellar resistant? If yes, do you have a theory as to why these varieties might be more resistant to cellar than others? Um, um, resistant, no, sadly enough, not. No. You, you see uh, that they have a preference for certain varieties, that's clear. And then the other question is a very interesting question, uh, something I also wonder about now and then, and I have no clue at all. But uh, if you have any ideas, I'm willing to discuss on it because I, I think it's a really interesting question. Are there any Anjo, Bartlett or Bosque trees in Europe? Uh, not in our region, so then uh, it's then you have to go more south, uh, and then you have the other varieties. But our uh, region is uh, so um, it's it's the other regions. So uh, yeah. And our final question is: Do any growers in Northern Europe have the old, large, uh, three-dimensional trees? And what are the biggest, largest trees you have? Uh, These old uh, trees? No, uh, no. Uh, and then uh, we have large trees because uh, uh, although, and then you have to make a difference between Belgium and Netherlands. Um, in Belgium, you can still have some uh, growers which have a, a spindle system with trees up to four and a half, five meters. But this is really crazy because they, they, it's, uh, it's not a way to increase your production. And in the Netherlands, your trees are two meters, two meters and a half height, and they get higher production than we do with these high trees. So it's all low tree, uh, high density orchards with low trees. That's the only thing which is uh, planted. And up to three, three and a half meters, uh, it's normal in Belgium. And that's really the benefit of having a good dwarfing rootstock that we don't really have in our cold climate. Um, you know, along those same, li same lines, what is the average age of an orchard there? Do you have any ideas? I should ask my colleagues. Average orchard, uh, I don't know, but um, it's very important if the production goes down, our advice always pull it out directly. Do not, uh, um, so you have to make an evaluation on the production. And I think an orchard of 30 years um, probably also, which it's difficult to, to answer this question because the older uh, orchards, it's the old system. And um, uh, these old orchards, often we just recommend to Pull them out because it's better to place a modern system you have more higher production capacity and then the question is how old can uh, how long can they produce and i think that's still an open question for pairs for some systems at least so we had one more question come in are the insecticides that you have lost or are losing in the near future um, affecting the mrls for importing pairs and i'm sorry my cats are fighting for some reason today in this room <laughs> Um, um, now and then it will have an effect, but uh, normally not because the MRL values uh, is a different toxicity evaluation than the, the reason why uh, these insecticides are banned. The insecticides are banned due to side effects on, uh, on a certain, uh, because uh, um, uh, certain, for instance, this mouse or other reasons uh, or uh, the toxicity in water, whereas MRL is looked at, at uh, uh, the toxicity of human. So it does not, it does not mean if we lose an in, uh, insecticide that this uh, will have an effect always on the MRL, but it can have because also you see the, the some warehouses which, uh, which um, place extra, uh, um, yeah, rules for for mrl values and so on and now and then you have to be you have to just have to watch out and ask your uh, uh, exporter to ask for the newest uh, guidelines but it will not have directly an influx always influence always well again we'd like to thank you so much for joining us here today i know it's rather late there and you've been uh, so kind to provide us this presentation and answer all of our questions today as i mentioned earlier this will be recorded and uh, please send me your questions so i can forward them on to um Stu and get you some good answers thank you again so much for coming thank you